All right, everyone. So uh, let's just finish off this particular sutta, the uh, Baya Bhairava Sutta, the fear and dread. Uh, and uh, so we have seen how the uh, Buddha to be, how he uh, overcomes uh, all of these dif last defilements of the mind, how he overcomes the fear and the dread. Uh, and of course, when he overcomes those things, uh, what he is doing, he is overcoming basically the remaining kind of defilements. And when you overcome the remaining defilements of the mind, then what happens is that the mind is ready for samadhi. You know, these are the things that hinder you in samadhi practice. So the next paragraph here is the paragraph that you see here. So the consequences of all this practice is that the Buddha says, my mind, my energy was aroused, was roused up and unflagging, my mindfulness was established and lucid. My body was tranquil and undisturbed, and my mind was immersed in samadhi. Yeah, it was uh, one-pointed and, and uh, immersed in samadhi. Actually, it doesn't have the word one-pointed there, so, which is weird, chittang ekagang. My mind was one-pointed and immersed in samadhi. Yeah. So this is the result. Yeah, the result is that the mind really comes together and these things that you see on the screen there, uh, uh, energy, mindfulness, tranquility and samadhi, uh, these are four of the seven factors of awakening here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you recognize that. Uh, uh, the, uh, what is missing there is the awakening factor of uh, investigational qualities is not there. The peat Piti, the, the rapture is not there, and the upeka, the equanimity is not there. But these are four of the seven factors of uh, awakening. And the factors of awakening are all about samadhi practice. Yeah? So uh, we are here, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the mind becoming ready for awakening itself. Uh, so the, once the defilements are gone, what happens with the mind is that you get the natural energy of the mind. Uh, when the suttas talk about energy, it doesn't actually mean exertion. It doesn't mean striving. Uh, striving is when you have to try to give rise to energy. You are trying to live in a good way, trying to overcome the defilements of the mind. Uh, but at this point, it's natural. It happens by itself. Uh, and the energy is like the energy that you feel automatically happening within you. The mind is powerful, naturally powerful, and you don't have to do anything for that to happen. Uh. Yeah, this is the difference between exertion, striving, and the natural energy of the mind. It happens as a consequence of this sort of practice. Uh, it is unflagging. The idea here is that uh, it, it kind of keeps going by itself. Yeah, the, the energy is natural as long as the mind is pure. You have to have this kind of energy. Uh, and this is a very beautiful quality of mind. Yeah, when you have this kind of quality of mind, when the energy is there, uh, it is very pleasant because you don't have to strive anymore you feel that you feel energized naturally you close your eyes the energy of the mind is there it's easy to focus and with that energy always comes mindfulness because when the energy is there it feels pleasant the present moment is nice and mindfulness will come as a consequence energy mindfulness and also the degree of gladness feeling good about yourself, these are qualities that revolve around each other and they tend to arise together. When you're mindful, you tend to have energy. When you have energy, you have gladness. When you have gladness, you have mindfulness. Why? Because gladness leads to being wanting to be present. When you are present and you are glad, the mind is energetic because the mind is happy. It kind of, they come, come together in this way. And then when that energy is there, the mindfulness is there, yeah, it is lucid. The Pali word is asamutta, which means basically means that you are not absent-minded. Yeah, asamutta there. Uh, so the mind is clear. The mindfulness is strongly established. Uh, and then, uh, as you carry on with that, very often you do this through your meditation practice. The body starts to feel tranquil. Uh, yeah, when the body is tranquil and undisturbed, uh, this is the kaya. And again, it's a very beautiful state. The mind is stable, the mind feels really solid, sorry, the body feels really solid. Uh, you're sitting there in meditation, uh, watching the breath maybe, uh, and you don't want to do anything else in the whole world. Uh, you're so content with what is happening. Yeah. You're really, really happy with this. Uh, and uh, this is very, very, very pleasant when you get to these states 
of the body and the mind uh, because now meditation is automatic happening by itself uh, all you have to do sit back observe the process happening it's like a process happening to you and you just enjoy this process happening to you uh, very very easy natural uh, and because it is easy natural because you are enjoying what is happening uh, the mind is attracted to the object because the breath is beautiful at this point you are drawn in and as you're drawn in the samadhi happens by itself because the mind is drawn towards the object of meditation and it becomes unified everything kind of unifies together this is really the process that you're seeing this is how samadhi arises banning defilements and then this process takes over as a consequence so this is this whole idea on the Buddha's part that meditation is an automatic process. All you have to do is put the causes into place and the causes here are the abandoning of the defilements of the mind. Then this whole thing happens. I'm going to look at this in much more detail even in the next sutta we come to. Next sutta is called the Upakalesa Sutta. We start that tomorrow. It's one of those very inspiring suttas. One of the main things I wanted to look at during this little sutta retreat. But this kind of gives you a preview of what is happening here. And then, once this has been established, and of course comes the samadhi, comes the jhanas again. Yeah, the jhanas are practiced, jhana one, two, three, four. Uh, and then when the jhanas are in place, then you have the uh, awakening experience, the recollection of past lives, uh, the understanding of the laws of kamma, how kamma drives the process of uh, Rebirth, uh, yeah, and then finally the awakening experience itself, uh, when you have the deepest insight into the nature of reality, you see non-self, uh, and you make an end of rebirth completely. This is what comes after this. Uh. And what is interesting about this process, you see this process in a number of suttas. The Buddha talks about various ways to overcome defilements, various ways to meditate, and each one of them, they end in the Buddha becoming the Buddha, yeah, the Buddha to be becoming the Buddha. And sometimes you can ask yourself, well, are all are these different ways of becoming the Buddha, or are there different aspects of the same practice? Uh, and it seems quite obvious that these are just different aspects of the same practice. Yeah? Sometimes the Buddha focuses, like he does here, on a certain way of overcoming defilements, uh, other times of other ways of overcoming defilements. So he focuses on different ways. Uh, and uh, it's not as, you know, the Buddha used different means, basically, to arrive at the process of awakening. And we can take it that it took a long time to get to this spot. Uh, because, again, we can ask the question, when they actually did he do these things? Uh, if you look at the normal sequence of events, he went to the two teachers, then he had ascetic practices, then he attained the jhana, then he became awakening. But what about this? Where does that fit into that sequence? Uh, and remember that the se all of these sequences are like contracted. Uh, yeah? We don't know how long this took. It may have taken a while. Yeah? The time under the Bodhi tree, was it only one night? Well, that's kind of the tradition, but probably it was much longer than that. Uh, he would have been striving, he would have been trying to understand the nature of his mind, overcoming the defilements. Probably it took weeks, maybe months even, uh, to actually practice all of these things after he gave up the ascetic practices. Uh, so we need to kind of allow for the fact that the suttas often just present the highlights. Uh, we don't see the full biography. The whole biography is kind of hidden from view. What we see are the highlights of the Buddha's life. Uh, and then we can kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. And these are all those blanks that we are filling in. These are the things that the Buddha practiced as he was going on. Uh, so it's a kind of it's a more complex story than sometimes we think it is. Uh, Remember that we are dealing with an oral tradition, uh, and in oral tradition you cannot really give all the details because people can't remember it. Uh, yeah, what you have to do is you have to give certain structured suttas uh, that are easy to remember, and then it is up to us to kind of draw all the threads together and come up with a story that seems like the, what actually happened to the Buddha to be, how the awakening came about. Uh, oral tradition has a certain limitations on the kind of information that can be passed down, written if you write things down, it allows more flexibility because you don't have to obviously memorize things, which uh, places those limits. So then the Buddha goes through all of the jhanas here. I'm not going to look at that now. And then he kind of has the three knowledges, uh, yeah? uh, all the rebirth, then we have the ending of the defilements, uh, and then we have the complete 
destruction of ignorance, uh, yeah, and then we come towards the very end of the sutta. I'm not going to go into all of that now, I'm just going to look at the very end here. Uh. And the Buddha says to this Brahmin, Brahmin, you might think, uh, perhaps the Master Gautama is not free, free of greed, hate and delusion even today, and that is why he still uh, frequents remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest. Uh. But you should not see it like this. Uh. I see two reasons to frequent remote lodgings in the wilderness and the forest. I see a happy life for myself in the present and I have compassion for future generations. Yeah, so this is why the Buddha carries on living in the forest. Even if you're an arahant, you don't really want to stay in the city, you want to be in the forest. Why you want to get away from all the people, all the hassle, all the hard work? <laughs> kind of dealing with all the problems in the, in the world. Uh, and you want to, it's easier, even for a Buddha, it's easier to actually attain the jhanas and the deep states of meditation in the forest than it is in the city. Uh, because you don't have all of those problems that hinder you, that sidetrack you, that make you busy. Uh, even the Buddha gets busy in the city. Uh, so Buddhas enjoy solitude. Uh, the last thing they want to do is be around people. Uh, there is a nice sutta, I think it's, it's the, I think it's the Mahasunyata Sutta, the greatest sutta on emptiness, uh, where the Buddha says that after he emerges from a very profound meditation on emptiness, yes, and these are some of the most deep and profound meditations that are available on the Buddhist path. Uh, after he emerges from those uh, and he comes out uh, and then the people want to see him, yeah, lay people come, the kings come, the king's ministers, uh, and he says that, at that time, my mind is inclined towards seclusion. I talk, talk, which is intended to dismiss those people as quickly as possible. <laughs> That's kind of nice, right? The Buddha just doesn't, even the Buddha doesn't really want, even though he has compassion, his mind is so powerfully inclined towards solitude, he doesn't really want to deal with people. And it's kind of, you can imagine here how different this is from most of us in the world. Most people in the world, we are happy in company, we enjoy company, not all the time, but a lot of the time. It's important to us to have people around us. Yeah? And this is this idea that what the noble ones say is happiness, ordinary people say is suffering. What the noble ones say is suffering, ordinary people think is happiness. It's upside down. They look at the world in a completely different way. The eye, they don't no longer rely on the on uh, hanging around people, they want to be by themselves, even the Buddha. And then he has compassion for future generations, uh, and this is again the idea that you want to be an example for others. Uh, yeah, the Buddha leads by example, he lives in solitude, it reminds us of the importance of solitude, so he carries on with that kind of uh, conduct, even after his awakening experience. Uh. So it is not because he's still trying to get enlightened, but because he has uh, come to the very end of the path. Okay, so now we're coming towards the very end of this sutta. I'm just going to wrap up this sutta, and then uh, tomorrow we can start with another one, so let's see at the very end here what it has to say. Then uh, Janusoni the Brahmin, he says, Indeed, Master Gautama has compassion for future generations, since he is a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha. Excellent Master Gautama, excellent Master Gautama, as if he were writing the overturned, revealing the hidden, pointing out the path to the lost, or lighting a lamp in the dark, so people with good eyes can see what's there. Master Gautama has made the teaching clear in many ways. Yeah, so this is kind of one of those nice things. This is one of the standard passages you see at the end of every sutta when the Buddha has given a teaching. You have writing the overturned. There is this idea that the way we normally see the world, we see the world in an overturned way. We see things upside down. We don't really see things right. And uh, so the Buddha turns it from being upside down to, to the, the right way up. And in this way he gives us access to seeing the world in the right way. 
This is so interesting because it doesn't feel like we see the world in an overturned way. It's very hard for us to see this. Uh, but actually this is what kind of the, uh, the Buddha is doing. He's helping us to write things that are completely wrong. Uh, he reveals the hidden. Yeah, the world is hidden for us. Uh, we don't see things clearly. Uh, other places it is said that the Buddha draws back the veil from the world. The world is veiled. Uh, we can kind of have a blurry idea of what is happening behind the veil, but we don't really know. The Buddha comes and draws back the curtain, draws back the veil, so you can actually see what is going on there. The re reality is hidden to us. Uh, so you can see why it is so important to have a degree of confidence and faith in these teachings, uh, because we only have a vague idea of what is going on. Uh, we don't really understand. Uh, and the really deep things on the path, the deep things like non-self, uh, these are things that are not really understandable intellectually. Only through insight can they be understood. Uh, the intellect can only take you a little bit of the way, uh, and it is insight at the end of the day which will really reveal to you what is going on there. Uh, so confidence and faith is important in Buddhism. Yeah, otherwise you don't even get started on this path. You really have to believe that the Buddha did have some kind of insight. Uh, and this is one of the things that I like about reading some of the suttas of the Buddha, is because it gets you closer to the Buddha. You start to get a feel for the character of the Buddha. Who was this person? Who was the Buddha to be? Who was this character that we find here? And you start to get a feeling for the Buddha as you read the suttas. There's something magnificent about the Buddha. He does things that are very difficult to do, even though he is an ordinary human being just like us. And as you start to see that, you start to relate to the Buddha in the right way. Human, yes, but human with very special qualities. Uh, and then the ability to break through her. Uh, it draws back the veil from the world, yeah, revealing what is hidden. Uh, most people can't see it. The Buddha is the eye of the world. Uh, the Buddha sees, and then he passes on the information to the rest of us. Uh, he sees for us uh, to enable us to be able to see also what is hidden behind the veil. Uh, he points out the path to the lost. We are just roaming around in samsara. We have no sense of purpose, no sense of aim, no sense of knowing where we're going. We are just roaming around randomly, hurting here, hurting there, hurting everywhere, pain, so much pain, don't know where we're going, trying to find the way, trying to find a solution to the problems of life, never really finding a solution. The Buddha said, here is the path. It's called the Noble Eightfold Path. That is what you should be doing. That is where you find a solution. Very hard to find that path without someone pointing it out to us. Uh, go here, uh, then you have the path. There's a beautiful little metaphors and similes for what, what, what we're actually trying to do here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and you notice then the last one, lighting a lamp in the dark uh, so that people with good eyes can see what is there. Uh, so have you got good eyes or have you got bad eyes? <laughs> if you have bad eyes, you have a problem. Uh, yeah? You have to wear glasses. Uh. If you have bad eyes, uh, you wouldn't be here if you had bad eyes. Uh. So the fact that you are already here is already something very wonderful. Yeah? It means that you have some kind of uh, right ideas, otherwise you wouldn't bother coming to this place. Uh. So I can say already that you have reasonably good eyes. Uh. But now you have to allow the Buddha to lamp light the lamp in the dark, yeah? And as you read the suttas, the brightness of the light goes up. The lamp becomes brighter and brighter, and you start to understand what this path is about. This is what we're trying to do here, trying to increase the luminosity of that light, so we can see more clearly what is going on. And when you see more clearly what is go going on, you stop stubbing your toes against all the roots and all the concrete that is lying everywhere and you kind of always keep hurting yourself and you're knocking your heads against the beams that are too low. The light is on. You can duck away from those beams and you have less suffering in your life as a consequence because you know how to live your life in the right way. Turning on the lamp in the dark is a beautiful metaphor for what this Dhamma is about. Gradually, gradually as you practice this path, you start to see what is going on. You start to understand why it is so important to live with kindness, to live morally, to do the right thing, to think in the right way, to perceive other people in the right way. You start to understand this. And as you understand this, uh, the light goes on, 
the next stage becomes possible. Meditation, mindfulness becomes strong. Then you start to be able to watch the breath and the path unfolds as a consequence. Uh, gradually, gradually, as the light goes on in this way. Huh? In the same way, the Master Gautama has made the teaching clear in many ways. Uh, it's very beautiful little similes what the path is about. Uh, I go for refuge to Master Gotama, to the teaching and to the mendicant Sangha. From this day forth, may Master, may Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Yeah, this is what they did in those days. They go for take the refuge and they go for refuge for life. That's kind of how they, how they would phrase this. That is what it means to become a Buddhist. Buddhist means to take refuge in the Dhamma. And of course, taking refuge in the Dhamma, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, means that you take this ser teaching seriously. Huh? When the Buddha talks, when the Buddha is giving a teaching like this, you open your ears, you try to understand. What is he trying to say with this? Huh? And as you try to understand and you, you take this on board, you take it into your heart, you start practicing these teachings as a consequence. Huh? It doesn't mean that you have to believe everything the Buddha says. Huh? But it means you should take it seriously, what he says. Uh, you shouldn't dismiss it out of hand. That's really what it means. Uh. Bhaya Bhairava Suttang Nittitang. Yeah, the end. Uh, Nittitang, the Sutta has come to an end. Uh. So there you are. That is the uh, Sutta on fear and dread. Uh, this is uh, the last little Sutta reading for today. Let's have a short break. A little bit of meditation if we like, and then we'll do some more Q&A towards the very end. <laughs>